First of all, welcome to welcome to Norway, Tom. It's uh, it's uh, it's not your first time here, but it's your first time as a, as a rider. Yeah, it is. Uh, I've been twice with my my mother and my aunt. My mother's Swedish. Hona svensk. She I have svensk. But well, I'll speak in English because my Swedish is embarrassing. So, but uh, yeah, this is my first uh, my first business trip. And if, if if there's anybody here who has. Some, read your three books about uh, Leo Demidov. Could you just explain briefly like, the, the, the story of the... Yeah, that first book, Channel 44, um, really starts with the premise of telling a crime story in a society that says, what if there was no crime? The society is saying, Stalinist Russia was saying, no crime exists. So how do you solve a crime when the state says there shouldn't be any crime? So that was the premise. Mm -hmm. And out of that premise was born the character of Leo Demidov, who is a state police officer, who is, at the beginning of the novel, richly rewarded for arresting innocent people, political prisoners. And he decides to redeem himself by going after um, the killer of these young people. And in so doing, criminalizes himself. That was the journey for him. And then with the three books, it was taking his life and his family's life and telling it over the period of the, of, 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 of the regime. So you, know, you have him as an old man in the final book, set against Afghanistan which was about this this regime coming to an end. So he was kind of like an agent for the Soviet government within the Soviet society. Yeah. And, and also, like, uh, a lot of people have read your book as well, The Norwegian Spy. Would you just explain briefly what the book is about? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, actually, the book starts up in Dubai, which is a place that really fascinated me uh, the first time I was there some kind of a modern day Casablanca in terms of, you know, spies from all sides and so on. And a lot of, you know, the major powers, you know, they have their interests there. So uh, my secret agent, the guy called Peter Bezel, uh, he is on his way to Dubai to, uh, to, uh, to recruit an Iranian defector uh, who's uh, fed up with the regime apparently. And uh, well, as in most crime and suspense novels, I guess, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, the operation does not go as well as they hope, and instead of going back with the uh, information from this defector, uh, he, he can't go back to Norway to see his girlfriend, he has to venture into Afghanistan and to, uh, uh, to start this hunt for some missiles that this Iranian guy uh, is saying that uh, are being uh, are being uh, targeting uh, Norwegian interests in a short time. So uh, basically, that's 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 the plot and that's the premise. And uh, what I wanted to do, though, was that uh, I, I used to be a nonfiction writer. I used to write, the, and I, you know, for example, writing about my experience as a soldier and so on, you know, and, and journalist in areas like that. And uh, I also, you know, when I was uh, when I was 10, 12 years old, I was a huge, you know, crime. Uh, you know, agent, spy novel, aficionado, and I felt that, you know, well, let's try to combine those two things. Let's try to write some, uh, you know, like a thrilling story that could have been a story that I would enjoy when I was when I was a little kid. So, in other words, you know, I'm writing, I'm narrating this story in first person, and that's to, you know, to evoke this kind of, uh, you know, uh, that you feel that you're closer to this agent and you know to get under his skin beneath his skin to say uh, what, what is it like to be a secret agent in our days in you know the wars that we're facing now so uh, i mean Oslag writes about a norwegian agent in our time but you wrote, wrote about leo demidov which in like the post world the uh, second world war um what kind of research did you do to to like get into his head and, and like understand what it was like to be a Soviet agent in the, in the 50s. Yeah, I mean, there's a big question with writing of what subjects should you write about, and there is a rule that is given to people uh, many, many times. It's given to me when I was 20, which is you have to write what you know. And by that, often people are saying you have to write a version of your life. Now, you know, that is on one level good advice, which is to say if that's the story you want to write, it's good advice. If you want to write science fiction, it's not very good advice. Um, if you want to write fantasy, it's not very good advice. Um, 
But I think what is the element of that that is true, that if you write about something that isn't your life, you have to pour yourself into it. There has to be something in that world that you really connect with passionately. And just as if you write about your life, you have to take the outside world and pour it into your life to make it relevant to everyone else. Otherwise, it's just sort of incidentals of your life. So that's the process that goes on. And with him, uh, with this character and this world, the fundamental question I was asking was how would I have behaved in that regime? It would have been very easy to say, I'm very sure I wouldn't have gone along with a murderous regime and that I would have resisted it. But morally, the question that's much more interesting is, I'm just not sure. It's very hard to know. If you're told that your family's life depends upon you acting to support a regime that is bad, can you say, I will risk my family's life? Um, so that was how I personally got into it. But I was wondering about that, Tom, because uh, like your book has been translated to Chinese, for example, and to a lot of languages in oppressive regimes. And how did the people there, how did they react to the stories about their Dembo and, you know, like his struggles with this, you know, like totalitarian state? It's an interesting question because it splits into two. Readers have very much, like from China, which is your first point, have got in touch with me and said, Tom, you don't live in a authoritarian regime. I actually do. This isn't just a story. This is this is how, this is my life. And did they send you emails? Yeah, they sent me emails on that subject. And they, they weren't hostile, but they were quite sort of, you know, this is actually real. This isn't just a fiction. Um, and the state itself didn't seem to mind. Uh, the Chinese censors passed it without any cuts, and it was also published in Iran. And my translator in Iran was actually arrested for carrying uh, too much research on Stalinist Russia. He was held without, um, without uh, in an isolation cell for three days, and then on the fourth day he was allowed to phone his mum. And they then, he finished translating the book and gave it to the censors. And I, I sent an email to him saying, I'm worried, you know, this book is about an authoritarian regime. It's very critical of one. You live in one. I'm worried. And he was like, don't worry, don't worry. And then they passed it without a single cut. Because the way they saw it was, well, it's about Russia. It's got nothing to do with us. <laughs> uh, so it's a split. Because you can see that they react very clearly to it being the parallel. But the state doesn't seem to mind. Uh, sure. but, but, but do you see any, like modern qualities in Leo Demidov? Like, could he be like an agent of uh, uh, a regime today? Um, well, he's, I mean, I, I, it's, that's, it's quite a complicated question because he really believes ideologically in a way that fewer people do, I think, now. Certainly in the West, there are less people who are as absolutely committed to one ideal. Um, that kind of, you know, the, the fanatical communist has kind of disappeared a bit. Who has he been replaced by? Well, I don't know. I think there's much more moderation now. Uh, we're much less sure when it comes to those things. And, uh, unless you, and what do you think? No, well, uh, I'm intrigued by Iran, you know. I mean, you're bringing it up. And to me, uh, what fascinates me with uh, that country is that they're some kind of successor of, uh, you know, the great powers in the Cold War. Because they're not like any kind of apolitical terrorists in like the way Al-Qaeda, for example. I mean, it's uh, at least in my interpretation, it's a very like clear-cut cynical state that is just like pursuing their interests in all the nearby countries. And that's actually, well, that's another premise in my book. I mean, it's since I was talking and referring to this Iranian defector that I was interested in, you know, researching and seeing what the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, which is, you know, like the special force that they keep and they also do a lot of, you know, kind of subversive activity in uh, in nearby countries and also elsewhere. So, uh, and you know, there are some interesting stories you come across on, you know, uh, uh, when you're like dealing with Iran. For example, my fixer, like if you're a journalist in a place like Afghanistan, and I'm not. I'm not such a good writer. I need to go to the places to actually describe them in detail, you know. I could never, you know, do that through books, you know, only. I mean, I read a lot of books too. So, in any case, I went to Afghanistan a couple of times, and one of my friends there uh, was a Afghan fix, uh, fixer, a guy who lived in a city called Herat, which is near the Iranian border. And that's perhaps the Afghan city most influenced by 
Iranian, you know, both uh, security forces, but also, you know, like Iranian trade and, you know, culture in general. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, he told me that, well, he told me a lot of secrets uh, eventually. Uh, the thing he told me the last day was that he was actually, uh, he was a convert and he was a Christian, which I said, damn, that must be fairly dangerous to be in Afghanistan, right? And he was like, yeah, it's kind of like this. But then he also told me that he was, that he had been tried to be recruited by the Iranians several times. And you know, the more I dug into this city of Herat and the different people who lived there, the more I found people who were completely paranoid by you know the Iranian activities there. Yeah, because everybody could be an agent. Exactly, Ooh. and that's interesting. And I think that's, I guess you know, like when I'm reading your books, uh, and not only from Afghanistan, even though that's, uh, but also you know, like from uh, from from a totalitarian regime like uh, like the Soviet Union, you get this like you get this very like paranoid feeling, and you know that. And one thing is to read that you know that was an oppressive state. Another thing is to evoke this feeling. So, how do you do that? I mean, how do you try to get on the you know? I mean, I think before, in a sense, the question, but just before that was you know, the, the different types of people in these regimes. I think you're right, there's a whole range. There are people who are cynical about it, as you said, who if you put them in a fascist regime, would be fascist. If you put them in a communist regime, they'd be communist. You know, who would do whatever it took to be powerful and to play the game. And to them, playing the game is all that matters. And there are some people who genuinely do believe something, whether it be a fanatical form of religion, whether it be a fanatical political position, and who do commit themselves. Uh, the cynics are kind of, you can move them around you know they, they're kind of interesting and there are cynics actually in the first book uh, the character of, of, of Vasily is just someone who, who doesn't really care who just does whatever it takes um, but uh, so, so certainly I think that is that that moves about and you will have that whatever society there, there exists but in terms of evoking it I try and find the small details uh, often I think the physical details um, offer up the psychological feelings like um, I was just saying this in the, in the, in the talk I just did, um, there was one, when, it, when you asked about paranoia, that the physical nature of the way in which people lived was interesting. And they had in um, you know, very cramped conditions in Moscow, there was a chronic housing shortage. And I partly think that the state was deliberately doing this because it wants people packed together. And this meant that if you were a husband and wife, you would often take the duvet and put it over your head in order to have a secret conversation to make sure your neighbors didn't hear because the walls were so thin and they were so close. And sometimes they would just live in a partition of a room. And then when you think about that and you think about the, the space we take for granted in our own private residence, whatever that might be, and you change that, suddenly you're, you can feel it very closely. It's like, it's like you're living that, that paranoia. A, a little bit about uh, uh, like the modern spy, the modern agent, because nowadays we see that the Zero Dark Thirty uh, won the Oscar and it's a, it's, a, it's a big box office hit, and uh, uh, Argo also won Oscars, and you have Homeland, which is one of the biggest shows on, on TV. What, what has happened with you know the classic spy or agent in you know modern literature or uh, uh, or movies? Well, I think, um, you know, we're all interested in the world, fundamentally, but sometimes there's, you know, if you want to go through all the CIA documents on the, the hunt for Osama bin Laden, much of it is is tedious. I mean, much of that intelligence work is, is and actually they say it in Zero Dark Thirty, just as a throwaway line, much of it is just going through huge amounts of information that leads nowhere. And it's, it's hard, grueling work. Um, and, you know, what a narrative can do is shape it all and make it feel like you can swallow it in, an, in a digestible form. And it's one of our ways of processing that, I think. Not all of us are going to want to read 2,000 pages of, of CIA process, but we all want, to, want, to want that story, I think. But I think it says something uh, more fundamental, perhaps, uh, which is that, you know, after a period of the war and, uh, uh, you know, unrest in many places in the world and in the Middle East and Central Asia in particular after September 11th, uh, it's fairly, uh, to me it's logical that you have this, uh, you know, surge of relevant and good movies coming up now and TV shows because you saw the same after the Vietnam War, you know, that the best movies, they came out, uh, you know, a couple of years after. Uh, the Americans withdrew from uh, from uh, from Vietnam, and uh, I think you know that this you know this phenomenon is something that people have been 
Uh, it's been part of the daily life for at least 10 years now, like reading papers, you know, watching television uh, from, you know, the war zones. And then now they want to get into this further, you know, they want to know what actually went on there. They want to know about the black sites and the torture. They want to know about the secret agents or, you know, the intelligence agencies who actually did something. And they want to know about the villains. So to me, Mm, this is uh, this is interesting, but, uh, but I think mean, one thing I'd put on that though is that I think the reason that Osama bin Laden is interesting is because he was killed. For example, we don't want to know about Iraq for some reason. All the movies about Iraq have been total box office disasters. People just haven't seen them, and it was very strange. They made lots of movies. Why, why is that? Do you think? I think it's because it was a disaster on every single level. You and need I think heroism was, of it. It's very hard to find any heroism at all there, any kind of glint of light in that morass. Whereas Zero Dark Thirty does offer, despite all the darkness, a positive out outcome at the end. And I think without that, I think, you know, so it's a strange mix. It's not just a question that we want to understand. We need to take something away from it that is. Well, do you think, like, uh, Zero Dark Thirty is a, is a success because it offers some kind of closure? I think if he hadn't have been caught, that movie wouldn't have been a success. And they were going to make it. They, were gonna, they had set it up. Yeah. They, had, they had done the whole script. So it was just an open ending. It was just about the hunt for him. And then they caught him, and they had to <laughs> add the last hour on. And I think without that hour, I don't think it would have been anywhere near as popular. Uh, that I agree. Uh, but I think, you know, when it comes to, like, for example, uh, Argo, that there you have this, you know, tiny little story from a very, actually, disastrous period of time for, uh, for uh, the United States of America and Iran, you know. I mean, we're talking about during you know the hostage crisis uh, around 1980 and still you know they managed to find this one story that uh, that was bizarre enough and was had enough heart to actually uh, to actually uh, uh, make a great film at least in my opinion but uh, so i think you know like, i think it's it's possible to 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 uh, to to see a film from iraq in the future that would also be a huge box office success because i think this has to do also with you know the proximity to the events you know like and the more the the further away we are from you know the disaster in iraq in time the more likely we are to see something but the question remains though that okay let's say that the hollywood uh as done some interesting movies at least, you know, like from this, the last couple of years, and also TV shows with Homeland. But what about literature? Because to me, uh, I see a void there that, uh, like in Norway, where, you know, where I, I talk to a lot of crime writers here, and few of them, you know, actually uh, write about this situation here. And also, you know, like, more surprisingly, I, I don't see many great, you know, thrillers or suspense novels coming out from, you know, the war on terror, whatever, even in in the UK or America. And, you know, I see that, for example, you as, you know, perhaps the most brilliant, the talented of all. I mean, you're writing from uh, Stalin's Soviet Union, you know, and why is that you think that, have you read some good, uh, some good thrillers from uh, from the war on terror re uh, recently? I think that it does, I think you're right, it does throw up a huge challenge to write about that from a fictional point of view. I don't know, it's hard to unpick why that's the case, necessarily. But I read the book um, about the, the attack on the Twin Towers, which which detailed, uh, which won the Pulitzer, uh, non-fiction, and which detailed uh, Osama bin Laden's father, and then Osama bin Laden. And it's a brilliant book. Is that The Looming Tower? Yeah, The Looming, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a great book. It's a great book. Uh, and then I was really up thinking, oh, you know, he's an incredible character, Osama bin Laden's father. You know, this real sort of, you know, a real sort of interesting, you could see him as a fictional character. He's a sort of brilliant man. And that his son, in many ways, is this appalling, uh, you know, was never going to be as good as his father. And I think that's where the desire to destroy. If you're not good at creating, it's much easier to destroy. And that's sort of, I think, that, and you could see that it's a great creative setup. You could see that. But it felt uncomfortable to me to imagine a fictional story about that. In a way, you think, well, we've got the true story. I just didn't feel like I could draw out from it for some reason. I read the book, but didn't feel like I was taking notes. and. I ideas were springing. Um, I, think, I think it's complicated. I it's I a hard one to explain, I think. But, but what do you think about uh, that the, the, the box office success of movies like Zero Dark Thirty and Argo and Homeland being a big uh, TV show? How, how do you think that will affect 
the way people like you or Aslak or other write, you know, spy fiction in uh, the next decade? Um, it's a tricky one. I think you know. I think the there has to be. Um, in order to be some success. I think what you said was right, you know, that the, that Iranian thing was a disaster, but that was a great story of triumph, you know, and it's the classic American ingenuity. You know, they come up with this fake movie to get them out. We, we know that story very well. It's a great example of something positive. Our, our ability to outwit people is very satisfying. So that was, a, you know, you, if, you find, if you can find the glint of light in the darkness, you can tell the story, I think. If we can draw something out of it. So when someone, at some point, I think you're right, in the future can see Iraq and find some story that they can pull out where we can feel, wow, that does tell something positive about humanity, then that's the story that will be a success. I mean, so I, I don't know. I think, I think if you're just telling a story where everything's going wrong, I think uh, <laughs> there's a limit to how many people are going to want to read that. A, a little bit more about, about your books and um, and how they're set in in Russia and the oppressive regime uh, in uh, in in, uh, in Soviet. Uh, what kind of reactions did you get uh, from Russian people, from from people who lived in the Soviet state? Well, the first people that we um, we got a reaction from were the uh, the expat Russian community in London, which is very big. And they were very positive, and I mean they're very friendly. They meet you, and in fact, like the, the, I, the, I gave it, I gave it to a, a journalist who uh, corrected some of the names, and you know we were on very good terms. But when we spoke to the Russian publishing houses, they were very reluctant, and partly this is because they're slightly suspicious about the Westerners writing about Russians. And I understand that suspicion, you're always a bit suspicious. Uh, but second of all, I think there was a sense of, is it just being critical? Is there some weird criticism of contemporary Russia built into it? Um, and so it took a while to find a publishing house that wanted to take a chance and publish it. And that was only published for the first time in translation uh, last year in March. And then it's done really well, I mean, which was very satisfying. They love crime stories in Russia anyway, and they have big, uh, a lot of crime there. Yeah, <laughs> they do. We have no crime. Yeah, it's interesting that yeah. actually. That's true. Um, but what do you think about the novels? Is is that what, what does connect with the Russian readers? Do you, do you think that I mean, a modern Russian reader? Do they like, how how much are they concerned about? Their history and the oppressive regime in the in the fifties. I think there are, you know, I mean, I think it's very easy to generalize about countries, and at the moment, you know, it's easy to think Putin's view on the world is the Russian view on the world, which it isn't. I think. I think there's a huge look at the protests that go on in Moscow. There is this huge underbelly of people who totally disagree with him and totally disagree with the way he sees, the way he's constructing society. He very much, though, is drawing on the Stalinist model uh, on many different different levels, including his relationship with the church. Like Stalin, to start off with, you know, they were very anti-religion. They were they saw it as a, a, th a rival threat to their authority. As soon as his popularity began to sink when he made the disastrous decisions about World War II, he then recruited the church to support him. And Putin has seen that very clearly. He takes very clear things that if the church supports me, that's good for me. So he's doing lots of things that you seem to be echoes from that. But I would then say there are huge numbers of people disagree. So generalizations are very tricky. I think. Well, we talked a little bit about uh, about movies here, and in a couple of years, we will probably add another movie to to the ones we're talking about, uh, which is the um, movie version of your first book, Child Forty Four. Um, for a little, could you tell us a little bit about what has happened with uh, with uh, with the book going? Becoming a movie and what your expectations are? I mean, the process has been a tortuous one. Uh, it was bought before the book was published by Ridley Scott to direct. And who is it, like the guy who did Alien? He did Alien. Gladiator. 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 Um, he did the that, that was a nice phone call to get. <laughs> and it was a phone. He did ring me actually. Oh, this is really Yeah, I think I was actually just like buying some milk or something. And, and they never ring you. They always their assistant always rings you. So you always get someone say, "Will you take?" Ridley Scott's call, and it flashes through your head just to say no and hang up really fast. <laughs> but then you're like, yeah, okay, I'll take the call. Uh, and he, he's very, he is very nice, and he has a nice office full of all the props from the movies. And so to like, so start off with, you're incredibly excited, and you're like, wow, Ridley Scott wants to make it, which means it's going to be made tomorrow. And you know, they then write the script, which was written by Richard Price, he's a great writer. So you love the script. Often writers get very critical of the script, but it is a great script. 
Richard um, Price, who also has, has been written for, has been writing for The Wire and The Great Crime. Yeah, he's novelist. a novelist and he's a, he's a really great writer. He was Oscar nominated for The Color of Money, uh, if you saw that. So, so that was a great script. And then they, they set up with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio to play Leo. And the budget was, I think, at one point the budget was 102 million. So then the next phone call, will you take a phone call from Leonardo? <laughs> that time I did hang up. I was like, no. Uh, <laughs> No, he never rang me, sadly, actually. Uh, I don't know why. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so he, but then it just seemed to get, there was a moment where Hollywood got very nervous about darker movies. And one of the things that I think has changed is they thought we have to just do Transformer-esque kind of movies. Yeah, like franchise. Yeah, like these big, colorful, bright movies. And, and for a while, it just seemed to get stuck in the mud. Uh, and it's great with the success of we're talking about things like Argo and Zero Dark Thirty is a different kind of movie and these movies are making a huge amount of money mm -hmm. and suddenly it was back on the table again and now it's with uh, Nomi, Nomi Rapes who people know from The Girl the Dragon Tattoo she's playing Racer uh, Tom Hardy who you maybe know from the Batman the third Batman movie has the mask he's playing um, he's playing Leo and Gary Oldman also from Batman actually uh, hi this is Gary <laughs> I, I like Gary I'm talking to know me straight yeah. away. Uh, so yeah, no, exactly. They're they're playing it, and so it's going to get start filming in May. Ooh, wow, congratulations! Thanks. I guess this must be like a dream for every you know <laughs> spy novelist to get that phone call when you make a movie. Yeah, it's not quite the same, you know, when you get it from the Norwegian guys, you know. <laughs> no, but yeah, of course. I mean, actually, well, I'm really envious when it comes to Tom Hardy, you know, because I was asking, you know, like, who would who would you like to play Peter in like? some future movie and I said, well, you know, the dream would be Tom Hardy. Mm -hmm. I think he's, he's a great actor. With another movie. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> but still, well, it's a pecking order, I guess. Mm. But, about so, that, but, but, you know, like, swinging of movies is interesting, though, because, I mean, the films that we're referring to, Argo, Zero Dark Thirty, and, uh, I mean, they're known for being, they're, they have a very, like, documentary approach to their, uh, through their filmmaking, mm. and I think you know, I've been I've been intrigued by that. And I think it somehow began with uh, the Bourne movies, particularly Bourne Supremacy and Bourne Ultimatum, directed by Paul Greengrass, who was a British uh, non-fiction uh, writer, actually, uh, and uh, he was a war reporter, and he was also a documentary filmmaker, mm. and he somehow you know like took his documentary approach. Which included, you know, like a lot of references to, you know, Italian neorealism, to the Battle of Algiers, you know, all this kind of moves from the 50s mm -hmm. and 60s, and he, and he, uh, and he took that into the Hollywood blockbuster, mm -hmm. into the born world, and that was very, uh, that that fascinated me, and I liked it a lot. Mm -hmm. I thought it was great, you know, because it created a certain like authenticity that was unheard of before that. I mean, look, look at James Bond, you know, in the late 90s, you know, that was just. It was ridiculous, right? Mm. And uh, uh, when Denise Richards playing Christmas, Jones. exactly. Well, I was about to mention her, but I, I didn't. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, so 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 what you can see now is some more, uh, I guess you know, like a more realistic approach to 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 spycraft in movies. And my question is, of course, as a writer, how is it possible to uh, do something like that? in terms of your writing and I don't have the uh, recipe of course you know I was trying when I was in all you know I mean to be humble but uh, when I was writing my first book I was trying to I was trying to uh, I, I was trying to use my you know non-fiction approach you know like into you know like some fictional story but still it's hard and I think you know like the trends that we see in Hollywood are likely to be trends that will be uh, you know, transferred into literature in a couple of years. And that's why it's interesting to talk about it. Yeah, we mentioned the, uh, Jason Bourne and James Bond here, and, and our, on our blog, yeah, like when we do interviews, we always ask people the simple question, James Bond or Jason Bourne? So there you go, Tom Rob Smith, James Bond or Jason Bourne? <laughs> well, I actually have written an introduction to, uh, from the new Vintage is a publisher in England, they've republished all the James Bond, the Ian Fleming's. And they asked me to do from Russia with love. And I hadn't read them for a while. I read them as, I loved them as a teenager. And obviously Jason Bourne has then taken over in the sense of, you know, he was, as you said, Supremacy is one of the best thrillers ever made. It's a brilliant movie and you can't help but not, you can't help but love it. And in a sense, Bourne is, the interesting thing is as a spy, you can either do it about 
the character of being a spy and the, the effect that has on your personality, the cost to your personal life, or you can do it about what you're fighting for, king and country, you know, that, the, the, what, what is the thing you're representing? And in a sense, Bond in the movies becomes sort of slight, has gone quite old fashioned. It's about these sort of big ideas and less about, there's no character really. And um, in the movie James and Bourne, it's all about character. It's not, you know, you, the, the America has sort of disappeared. It's just about him and his relationship with his girlfriend, his kill, and all that kind of stuff. So that was my preference. But when you go back to the books, actually, I think the real character of Bond does begin to bubble up. For example, in the movies, uh, of, of, of uh, the Bond movies, you know, he always wears expensive clothing, he's always going to expensive restaurants, and we can kind of dismiss this as often product placement, which it is, and also just a bit superficial and uninteresting, and we can kind of get, not very, like, we kind of dis dismiss yeah, like it. like the glossy. Exactly, it just becomes about a, a kind of silliness. But when you read it in the books, it's about a love of life. It's less about just a sort of, I mean, it's snobbery on one level, but it's also about loving things that are great. And in From Russia with Love, there's so much information about how James Bond loves breakfast. He spends so long on having, you know, he goes to Istanbul and he's having, you know, this, these incredible figs with yogurt and honey. And you realize this book was written during rationing in Britain where people had nothing. I mean, people had like the gruel. And suddenly you realize Ian Fleming is giving people the thing that they can't have. And then it becomes quite generous when you read it. You, can't, you, you kind of can't help but like it. Whereas in the movies you think it's kind of excessive and silly there. So I have a, a, a deep fondness for both. And that is a very political answer. <laughs> well, that's perhaps the longest answer of your book. We're going to get a transcript of that. <laughs> yeah, but I, I agree with Tommy you know, when it comes to that, uh, that Ian Fleming is definitely a better writer than, uh, than Robert Ludlum, mm. who wrote the Bond books. Mm. No, the Bourne books, sorry. Uh, which are, uh, I would say they're kind of overwritten, you know, like, mm. in a certain way. And it's one of the examples where uh, the movies are better mm. than, uh, yeah, yeah. than the actual books. But who are your favorite agents of all time, like, through, throughout, the, like, the movies and literature? Wow, I think my favorite agent book ever, and I have a real weakness for Conrad, um, and so obviously I'm going to say the secret agent. I love idea, yeah, yeah, I love idealism gone wrong. And you know, agents are a great engine for exploring people who have big ideas and try and put them into action, and it just ends up a disaster. And that tension between the ideas and in practice is very. And secret agents and agents generally are a great place to explore that. And so I think that's one of my my favorite, you know, even though it's a disaster, obviously they're, they're anarchists and the secret agent. If you haven't read it, and they're useless anarchists. Um, and so they, it's quite fun to read about people who who aren't very good at what they do. Mm. <laughs> well, who's your favorite agent? Well, Except uh, Peter Vessel. Yeah, no, sure. Uh, and he's not my favorite agent. Um, he is promising, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, no, since, uh, since we have this Swedish connection here, I guess I have to answer my childhood uh, hero, uh, the Swedish nobleman and former leftist Carl Gustav Gilbert Hamilton. <laughs> and, you know, um, it's, uh, he was created by a writer called Jan Gjul, uh, which is very famous in Scandinavia, actually. And uh, I think they never became successful outside of Scandinavia. But uh, to us, you know, like, uh, his uh, struggle, it has some kind of Shakespearean drama in it, mm. to use uh, the favorite word from our blog. Mm. But yes, yeah, so it must be Carl Hamilton. Mm. Um, f finally, um, uh, there's always, like in literature, there's always, uh, like, the, there comes some, like, sh paradigm shifts. Uh, what, what do you see as the next, next like, shift in spy literature or, or spy movie? What, what will happen with the, the classic spy novel within, you know, the next three, five, ten years? Or within the novel? Yeah, no, or, or, or the movies. Uh, spy fiction. This is a predict predictions of the future. You can take the first prediction of the future whilst I make something up. <laughs> no, <laughs> They're always so wrong, you know. I mean, I mean, look at what people said in the 50s about the future, you know. It's just absolutely, you know, ridiculously wrong. So please. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, the predictions of the future are a safe way of humiliating yourself, that is true. Uh, I don't know, I think we've already come across, we've already touched upon one of the big transitions, which is the movement towards, about the character. Uh, and I think now, uh, it's hard to see, 
that that will switch back to ideology anytime soon. I think it's going to be very difficult for us to really embrace someone who is just about an idea. I think we all want to know their, their lives and their beliefs. Although having said that, in we spoke about this last night, we had dinner last night, but Jessica Chastain in Zero Dark Thirty has no character mm. outside of her obsession for that search. Mm. And that's very different. It was, uh, you, I mean, you, it jarred you a little bit because it's, it's unusual. It's, 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 it's like yeah, It's interesting because she's, she's based upon the same character as, as Carrie in Homeland, like the real life character as CIA woman, but, yeah. but Carrie is, it's like she's almost only character, but Jessica Chastain in, in Zero Dark Thirty, as you say, is no character. It's like two different approaches to the same. Uh, same yeah, and you may beg to differ, but uh, I actually prefer Carrie Matheson in that regard. You know, and I know it's kind of schmaltzy, you know, but still, when she's uh, when she's like standing in her kitchen, you know, sipping wine, and you know, Brody left her, I just, I'm heartbroken, you know. <laughs> I just think that that proves with predictions how difficult they are to make because she again, I, if, you, if we said this before I'd seen the movie, I said it's all about character and suddenly you have this great spy character, or, I mean whether you, I mean she's a successful, yeah. so let's say a successful mm. spy character who is all about the obsession to catch someone uh, and her whole personal life is stripped out and she's just about getting this guy. That was, so that was, you know, mm. again another shift, it felt like a bit of a shift there. I wonder whether we'll move back towards that, people cutting out the personal. But anyone, whenever they've tried to add the personal to James Bond, it's been a catastrophe, mm. and they've uh, they've tried to pull it back again. So, um, mm. um, finally, before we um, before we leave the stage, uh, you're both working on new novels. Just briefly tell us what we can expect from uh, uh, from you guys in like two, in the rest of 2013, 2014. Yeah, well, a lot of hard work, I guess. I hope, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I was, um, as I was, you know, I, I, I was talking a bit about it uh, earlier today, and, you know, I think that the only, uh, the only principle I have in writing is to write about something that means something to me, about the heart. And, you know, for me, there are certain, you know, experiences that, you know, made me the way I am. Uh, and, uh, you know, being a soldier and being, you know, like, deployed in, you know, areas like that is one. And then growing up in this city here is another one. So what I'm about to do, you know, when it comes in terms of Peter Vessel and his uh, future, is to actually bring him back, bring bring him back in time to Oslo in the late 90s, and like he's, he's coming of age, and trying to combine the suspense novel and a coming of age story, and it's challenging, but it's also cool. It's coming along. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what, what can we expect from your next book? Yeah. Yeah, it's actually um, finished. I'm gonna, it's going uh, to be published in Germany in October. Um, which is funny because I haven't actually delivered the translator yet, but uh, they translate very quickly in Germany. And it's, it's very different. It's not historical. It's contemporary. Uh, it's partly set in England and partly set on a farm in Sweden. Um, and it's based on, we were talking about this actually with Thriller, it's based on a real event. And I do think, uh, I agree with this sense that you have to build them around something that people can recognize. Obviously you're building a fictional world, but I think if the core doesn't have some recognizable truth, then it's, I think, particularly with thrillers, people are very suspicious of them. They, they, they don't really engage with them. So this is very different. Uh, it's a very different protagonist. It's a woman in her, in her early 60s. Very unusual for a thriller to use uh, a woman in her early 60s as the main, as the main character. And it's a bit of a risk, but it feels like after a trilogy, uh, it's, time, it's time to take a risk. So we'll see. We'll see how it does. Uh, okay. Thank you both, and good luck with your next books. And, uh, and thank you all for coming here. Yeah. Thank you.